Today's video will be a departure from the main series, Definition of Galagog, um, and will instead linger on the English translation of De Plancy's Legends of Ghosts and Demons. But before we open the book, let's first answer who was De Plancy? Born only a year before the French Revolution was due to end, 1793, uh, Jacques Collin de Plancy was known as a French writer, occultist, and demonologist. His full name was Jacques Albin Simon Collin de Plancy, um, born, of course, in Plancy, France. Um, and I'm mostly going to call him de Plancy because that's a lot easier for an Englishman to say. I'm not going to lie to you either. Finding out information about de Plancy was rather difficult, and a lot of the information that is cited on clear timelines just links to a Wikipedia page. Um, from there, however, every reference is in French. So, I found some rough English translations, but nevertheless, I would advise that you take this biographical account as changeable. The uh, source in question, <laughs> bear with me. Leon Fremont's Revue Champagne et d'abri Histoire, Géographe, Archéologie. I'm sure the Frenchmen are very proud. Um, but as far as I can tell, that is essentially an encyclopedia of the entire Champagne region. Um, and it's written in 1880. So if that is the main source for this one mysterious man's life, and that from that it can't even pinpoint who his mother is, then that might tell you a few things about not only post-revolution record keeping, but also just how much faith we're going to have to put in the vague story of who Jacques Collin de Plancy is. Um, but anyway, on to our mystery man. Starting dramatically, his mother was executed only a year after his birth, and it appears as if she was the sister of a revolutionary figure. The source suggests um, George Dunton, um, but I find no mention of him having had a sister, so already we are in dubious territory. Um, likewise, although I found one revolutionary Freemason um, who helped storm the Bastille and a revolutionary assassin named the Angel of Assassination, I still never did figure out the true identity of de Plancy's mother. Um... <laughs> So against all English judgment in my marrow, I will have to rely on the comments of uh, Frenchmen um, from the 1800s. So this Legends of Ghosts and Demons is already proving to be too much for my immortal soul. Um, anyway, having adopted the aristocratic uh, de Plancy to his name, uh, he began to work as a printer and publisher within Plancy in Paris. Uh, inspired by the free-thinking movement, and in particular Voltaire, the man seemed to generally live his life as uh, principally an intellectual pursuit. He followed the traditions of previous demonologists. He catalogued demons by their names and titles of nobility. Um, but before, just before we get into his flagship work, I'd like to say that that particular issue of titles and names when it comes down to demons, I think is extremely interesting. So you have the false monarchy of demons in 1557, and even at its title, although generally for its entire content, um, it's written within the perspective that the hierarchy of royalty is something divine, protected, and moral, and that demonic entities have distorted that system to match one of tyranny, um, and that they use that to oppress and terrorize the world. And then when you get to the next sort of big grimoire of the ages, the, you get to the Lesser Key of Solomon, and that's perhaps a little bit more apolitical. But, but I think that its apolitical nature is best described as a focus uh, limited to the self. Um, at the time that it was written, it used terms and categorizations which were often seen as heretical. Uh, but bear in mind, magic wasn't something that was seen as inherently nefarious. Uh, nowadays, with an obvious lack of belief in low and high magic, there is that sense that you fit into, say, one of two camps. Um, either you love crystals and would never practice curses because you read a Wiccan book and they say, aha, it comes back tenfold. Um, or you diminish it to just being quote-unquote psychological as if that reduces it to cinders and then generally accept 
um, even despite the church's uh, the Christian church's tradition of ritual and uh, magic, um, that anyone who casts spells is immediately going to hell, um, at least so far as you'd believe the church to say. Which I find both of these positions to be almost preposterous, just almost, because they do make sense in the way that these views accurately depict the current mindsets of modern society, but it doesn't make sense in in that it might tar the past as some backward magic believing band of fools who are either decadent demonologists and and uh, and woods witches or inquisitors and enraged toothless peasants. I don't especially like those categorizations. Um but in the lesser key of Solomon, however, there is a different sort of perspective. Magic can be fine, at least at the time and during the Renaissance. Magic can be fine sometimes, and it can be tolerated and widely believed sometimes. Um, but this book does still contain a lot of hell-sounding language, and and it is also an explicit guide on contacting the dead, the demonic, and the entirety of that. So it's more the fact that the reason it's controversial is because of those factors, not just because of magic in general. Um, but but why is that important? I would say that it's important because it's shifted away from denigrating demons to instead presenting them a little bit almost objectively. They're treated as assets and reagents. Effectively, they aren't even necessarily considered powers that you bow to. Um, as with Solomon and the Jinn, uh, they're described as evil. Um, but they're described as something which you can contact and utilize the powers of, something you can trap um, and, and effectively exploit. Um, and that's because there are always ways to defeat them with magic or to um, a lot of demonologists, I guess, tend to bargain their way through it. Um, which I have. I'll get to a grimoire on my shelf soon enough. Though. I probably will reference it as we go through Duplancy's work. Um, it's the Book of Smokeless Fire. I cannot remember the demonologist in question, but We'll, we'll get to that. It's, it, I find Grimoire's very interesting. Hence, I just wanted to talk about um, that sort of shift, because I find that interesting, like that societal shift in how people treat Grimoire's and how Grimoire's um, treat demons and their hierarchies, because they've gone from that cautionary tale and myth to the idea of being magical assets in and of themselves. And it's not as if that's like a new idea. Like I said with King Solomon, you know, <laughs> we're talking a long time that that's been the case. Um, so I think it's two different um, philosophies on the hierarchies of demons, so to speak. Or, it, it, to be fair, even, I mean, the Lesser Key of Solomon doesn't even necessarily focus... It has the categorizations there. Um, you know, you, you have work being built of uh, built off of that idea of, um, like, royalty and uh, and monarchy, and, and that is the structure for demons you do have that idea planted but it's not it's not a special focus i don't think they are still treated more as like here are some wacky rituals you can do obviously i don't think that was a selling point of the book is do you want to do some wacky rituals but you get what i'm saying um because by the time we get to the 17 and 1800s you find a lot more grimoires that tend to have sort of forgotten the start of um the false monarchy of demons and then you're you instead rely on the imagery of that, coupled with the sort of impassive lesser key of Solomon. Um, so the entirety of monarchy, quote unquote, becomes this sort of cautionary tale um, around the 17 and 1800s. And it can still, it still includes that aspect of bending demons to your will or that you can learn to protect yourself against them. Um, but it is a little societal shift, which I think is interesting. I'm by no means an expert on the topic. Um, and when it comes to occultism, and especially when it comes to demonology, there's a lot of personal twists on everything. So, for example, it, it might not even be that demonologists have lost respect for the divine, so to speak, in, in that general sense. But it might be that all demonologists are influenced by the mortal realm, including its uh, politics at the time. With that in mind, though, let's move on to Duplantis' flagship work, Dictionnaire Infernal. <laughs> the Infernal Dictionary. I'm so sorry for, for my, like, slightly mocking French accent. I, I, I can't really help myself. Um, 
but yeah, I'm, I'm now going to put up, here's a lovely photo that greets you once you've opened the Infernal Dictionary. It's a little woodcut depicting a little demonic throne there, and it has this sense of chaos around it. I will probably try and look into the symbolism of this um, to, to make a whole, or like at least include it in like a good part of the video, but it's difficult, right? Because there's a lot of stuff happening here, and I, I'm not really an expert on it that there's i mean you have there's a jester in in the bottom right there um i don't know what he's holding there i don't know whether that's relevant but it seems like there's like musicians there's um people they look like they might be dancing um people doing handstands certainly um there's like <laughs> someone sacrificing a baby by the looks of it in a cauldron there um and it looks like there might be even next to like the uh, the the fire smoker. It looks like there might be like discarded remains of a, of at least a child. So it's it's quite quite messed up because also I think I'm not sure if that's like, but because on the left side of the woodcut there there's also like a platter. There are, there's two platters even, and there are people and demons are like eating from this. Um, it looks as though women um sort of being taken in by these demons and and eating children um which checks out to be quite a horrid scene because they all seem to be sitting with a demon each and they're being sort of taken in by them um and then in the top left i guess there are there are people dancing in a circle arm in arm with demons which looks a little bit pagan to me looks a little, looks a little bit wacky um I'm not sure. Is the moon represented as being backwards? There is that a backwards moon, or is or is the image just just? <laughs> or am I am I just stupid? I I don't I don't know. Is it likewise above the it might be Satan. I wouldn't want to guess, but likewise the demon sitting in the throne, the um, the cloven demon there. Um. The I I don't know if there's any importance to the horns. I don't know what that is above his head. I I don't know whether that's meant to be the heart. I don't know whether that, because that would make sense, right? So, in um, for example, generally in in Christianity, um, although we tend to like look at ourselves in modern day as as being led by the heart is a good thing, um, generally Christianity doesn't like to, um, or at least a, a strong doctrine of Christianity, like it, within the text, you're not really meant to be led by your heart because your heart is, um, it's it is within the physical world, which which is naturally a very corrupted world. People in in Christian faith, I think in many many faiths, you, you see this a lot. There's an idea of chasing asceticism, of chasing sort of a relief from the mortal world. Um, so meditation obviously started something like that. We, we obviously prayer um, has that to a degree. Um, people starving themselves. You think of like monks and monasteries. These are very simple to grasp ideas. It feels like. Um, so I'm not sure if that is a heart above the demon's head there, but it would make sense. It would make sense because that that would that would mean that like the head is in sorry the heart is in the head, as in you are acting solely on what the heart wants. You're not acting on what the soul wants and what can nourish the soul and what can nourish your faith. You are just acting on um. And essentially the hedonistic values of the heart or the um easily emotionally swayed values of the heart um which which is which is obviously something to me bear in mind if that is actually the case um it also looks as if he's just being a bit a bit a bit of an asshole and uh stepping on someone <laughs> so there is also that it just shows him as a bad dude i, I also to the left there is that um is that like are those a bunch of people, like, to the left of the throne, is that, like, a bunch of people just sort of fused together? Or or is that or is that something complete? Like, I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, but certainly it doesn't look very nice. I don't know, is that people offering their children? Is that, like, a family making offerings? I really do not know. And also, there's a woman to the left of that. Is she holding, is that rats? rats or perhaps doesn't look like birds yeah the rat queen I, I don't i don't know um there seems to be above that as well 
kind of almost vaguely angelic imagery, but actually they're just like flying amongst demons and they're on a broomstick. Um, so that's pretty that's pretty on the nose, isn't it? So you, I think you get the sense that these are like witches consorting with demons, which checks out. Is that also maybe a herald to the right of the throne, the dude to the right of the handstand? Um, it is like I don't know. He kind of looks like a herald to me. I'm not. That's not a horn though. That looks to be like a little flaming torch, maybe. But I don't know. Is that like a herald of Satan? Um, who who knows? To the right as well, I can see like some little dwarf men <laughs> battling each other with sticks. It looks like maybe they have, uh, maybe they are just children fighting with sticks. I don't know whether that's like a any um, intimation of war. Um, I I I really do not know. Um, more broomsticks. It's again, it's. I I think that. The level of analysis I can give on this um, does fall exclusively to what I've just said now, because I'm truly not that um, well versed on each and every um, bit of symbolism here. Um, in the comments, though, you know, if if, if you want to give any insight, then please happily, happily g give it a shot. Um, because it is interesting. It is very interesting. Obviously, I tackled it there from probably a more Christian perspective, um, because I just know that literature better, and therefore I know what contrasts it. Um, and I'm trying to think within the time, like I am trying to think within the time of. It looks as though if you go from right to left, um, I still don't know if that is someone playing an instrument being directed by a jester of a kind, um. But you do see from right to left, at least for the women on screen, they are um, stoking the fires beneath cauldrons. They're killing babies in there. Um, and then presumably you go to the left and they are feeding these children, um, perhaps their own children, to devils, which they are touching the arms of and seem quite uh, infatuated by. Then you go to the top left and it looks as if they're dancing in a circle with them um, and and it looks as if they like finally unified with them because also i'm going to butcher the the ritual a little bit here um i don't know the names i apologize i know it appears a lot in um in norse celtic um sort of rituals traditions but the idea of like dancing arm in arm i don't think the tree there is in the center um but a lot of fertility rituals do have people like dancing in a circle. And to the right of that little circle, there is, I think there's someone playing like a, a French horn or something. Um, he seems to be playing an instrument of some kind. So it looks as if they are having like a party. Um, but I don't know. I, I guess because of, there is obviously an aspect here of sacrificing um, a gift from fertility, sacrificing that to demons and then consorting with them. Um, and all of these women at this point are on the ground, and potentially they're 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 holding intimate relations with the demons. Because that used to be a thing as well. Um, it used to be believed that witches would basically just bang the demons. Um, <laughs> it would just be like kill your child, kill your husband, bang a demon, and then you can fly around like a witch. Um, that that was the, the so that is partially why I'm looking at it like this, as if there is like it denotes a pagan sort of um fertility ritual, um. Because then, yeah, that and it also explains maybe his shift toward Diplancy's shift towards Catholicism later in his life, which we'll get to. Um, the the idea that um, these women are sacrificing their children, they're sacrificing a gift of fertility, they're eating it alongside these demons. Then later they um, they they bang them, um, but they do it within like a pagan ritual, which is supposed to be for fertility. So it it kind of is like yeah. The fertility, which is the divine spark, which, you know, is, is God. There's that Christian perspective again, where you sacrifice the product of that and you've instead decided to dance with pagans in a in a fertility ritual. And then I think you can look at it. So you go from bottom right, bottom left, top left, to then the middle. And you see these women suddenly flying. Um, one of them, I think she might be flying without a broomstick there. I'm not too sure. Oh, no, 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 she, she does. She has a broomstick. Um, so, but, but they are, they do have them and they seem to be going then maybe to the top right, or at least they're circling around the throne to some degree. Um, 
I'm not sure if that there's like some horned horse there. I'm not sure whether that's kidnapped some children. Um or or where I don't know what that is precisely, I'm afraid. Um Either way, yeah, I I'm not sure about the rest of the image. Um, but certainly the idea of like something cyclical which does eventually like in the center of that is the mind led by the heart um and dictated by either satan or um Beelzebub or any 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 big demonic figure you want to ascribe to that um i i, I think that's probably the main message of this but um we're going drastically over time here now um i i think this was all to really illustrate that there there are a lot of wacky woodcuts and drawings in this book. Um, and, and it's the case of many good tomes regarding demons. Uh, this one was published in 1818, and it's regarded to be uh, De Plante's best known work. Um, and it says that some of the images, by the way, were added in the 1860s, but I can't tell whether that means all of the images or not, as in some images were added or some images were added. I don't know what that means, because... In 1822, um, its advertisement made no mention of the pictures, so it might have been the case that we only got these wacky woodcuts in um, in 1863, which would make sense considering how this was his first work, and he wasn't necessarily very popular by that point. Um, but obviously, over the years, you publish some more things, and people start to recognise you. Maybe that's like he goes back and revisits it. Um, but for the quick fun and horror of it, here is the 1822 advertisement of the infernal dictionary anecdotes of the 19th new century or historiettes recent anecdotes features and words little known singular adventures various quotations bringings together and curious parts to be used for the history of customs and the spirits of the century when we live compared with the last centuries now that was a lot <laughs> Frankly, if you didn't catch that, I'm happy to say that I didn't either. Um, I love my rambling quotes, and I love a good sales piece, but that was um, that that was too much. Still, I've read it a few times now, and I think I get what it's trying to say. Uh, essentially, we're talking about um, first-hand experience with demons, the stories of demons, historical accounts, and historical literature on demons, adventures, presumably meaning fictional stories or otherwise those first-hand accounts. Um, just to stand alone um acting as just general stories of them again um and then finally at the end i'm pretty sure it means to say contribute to the tradition of literature on the spiritual and demonic so pretty much just saying hey this this is now like entered into that realm of grimoires and, and other spooky things <laughs> by the way he became an enthusiastic Catholic about eight years after this was written. So that that's what I was getting at earlier. Um, there, there is like a, you know, some Christian perspective to probably a, a lot of his work. Um, I'm not sure whether he was raised Catholic. I'm not, I'm not sure. Like, again, the source is from an, uh, like an entire encyclopedia of an entire region that he lived in. Um, so that's a little bit absurd. It's kind of like, um, as far as I'm concerned, imagine talking about Oscar Wilde, but your only reference for Oscar Wilde is like him being listed as like someone who lived in the UK and you just talk about like fishing rights from the 1600s onwards. It's like, it's it's absurd. We, we have very little information on him, at least here. I'm not sure whether um, in France he's just very um, like little known as well or, or whether there's just a failure to translate all of that. Um Either way, his his enthusiastic um, turn towards Catholicism, it confused literally everyone, which I find very funny. Because uh, people who loved him were like, dude, <laughs> what about the demons and like Voltaire? Because he loved Voltaire, obviously he's a free thinker. So the idea of being like super religious all of a sudden. But you know, Voltaire wasn't anti-religious um, necessarily. But, but, you know, you're growing up post-revolution here and a lot of the aristocracy... They, they were very, very um, religious, and that, that was embedded in their structures. And if de Plancy did have his um, his mother like truly be executed from the revolutionary days, then that's quite... I that's a very complicated thing to think about. So we can't really guess too much towards the man himself, but 
you know, there's, there's something there to work with. Um, because also people who hated him, they pretty much got like, dude, are you like, did you just sign up to Catholicism to say sorry for summoning demons just before you die? Like, you just pay your way towards heaven at that stage. So even the people who, you know, even if you have like these really devoted um religious figures who who really hate the fact that he just like you know brings out books saying hey guys here's how you contact demons um <laughs> obviously it's catholicism so you can just sort of um there, there, I don't, obviously there are many reasons for it but there is that general sense of is he just exploiting the the benefits of that eternal afterlife here? So he, he got some shit basically. There was a lot of criticism for um for 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 his enthusiastic turn to Catholicism. Um, but joking aside, I think this does seem to indicate a more impersonal but nonetheless enthusiastic interest in the occult, which I personally can empathise with. Um, because in 1846 he published the um, the Dictionary of Occult Sciences and Superstitious Ideas, uh, which was another listing of demons. Um, but this seems a little bit more impassive towards um the way that you would treat demons symbolically. Um, and then he just quietly seems to have stopped. Uh, but that, or at least a large part of his work, isn't listed in the more inadequate sources that try to detail his life. Um. So that's who De Plancy is. And currently in my hand, I hold the English translation of a collection of his works. Uh, it's been translated by Natalia... <laughs> hold on. By Natalia Zasadzinska, which is a hell of a name for me to try and pronounce as an Englishman. Um, and it has many chapters which I'm interested in exploring for the sake of some fun, some spooks, and some general talking points about the occult. Um... Given how long this has gone on, though, I'm not going to start out with an immediate story from the book, um, just because we've covered a lot in this video alone. Uh, hopefully still, though, this serves to set the tone for what will be a largely informal look at a demonologist's work um, and, and a lot of the symbolism that, that, we, that we can have a look at. Um, but to get everyone in the mood, I'd like to draw attention to the opening quote on the first real page of the collection coming from a church authority in 1863. It reads, We, Pierre-Louis Parisis, Bishop of Arras, Boulogne, and St. Omer, given the report that has been given to us on legends of ghosts and demons that move among us, have not found in this work anything that could harm the faith of morals. Now I think we'll see about that. Have a good day, everyone.